Okay. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Lisa Garrow and I'm the founder of Candy Event Consulting. And we just had a chat before I hit the record button here um, that things have really changed and morphed and your events uh, as you have planned them in the past probably look completely different now than they did before. Um, for those of you that are with me on Zoom today, thank you so much for showing up this morning. Um, I've had so much fun. I think the question was how many of these short guides to learning have we done so far? And I think we're at number seven or eight right now uh, and looking at actually moving right into June. We've got topics going in right into June. So hopefully you guys can look at what the archives are. You can find that at candyconsulting.ca slash guides. And there's there's links right to the YouTube uh, recordings of those, as well as the downloadable booklet. So those of you that have joined me, I've added that to the chat today. Um, but this idea of having um, these short guides to learning, it really has been something that has been important to me because sometimes we make um, the work we do or planning events or working with our teams really complicated. And sometimes we feel like we are um, swimming in it. And we're not sure what direction the whole uh, focus for me last year with Candy Consulting was about clarity for myself and for the things I was working on. But for a lot of our clients, it was like, so what, like either we're paralyzed because we don't know where to go, or we are just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what's going to stick or we're sending somebody off to some kind of uh, live virtual event platform training so that they can get all the tools and, and then we're not sure how to adapt. Um, the idea of really getting clear and this idea of having short guides um, is that you get some high level concepts, but things that you can apply today that are gonna really help you get clarity in the topics that we're gonna be discussing. So today's topic, with no further ado, is, and I've got, I'm in my home office today. Um, so so I, I get my trusty uh, flip chart with me, which always makes me feel at home. Um, but welcome to the Candy Short Guide to Prioritizing What Matters. And, and as I started, doing some research on this topic. For you guys, what do you think of when you think of priorities? You can add it to the chat or if you wanna say something about that, what do you think of when you think of either priorities in your life or setting priorities in your life? Any thoughts around that? And hello. <laughs> to those that are joining us now. We've got uh, priorities that sometimes come to us as we grow up. There are some things that are become priorities as we live in community with others. Sometimes there are priorities that we put into place for ourselves because we have, I turned 50 last year and it was like, oh, I gotta start exercising again <laughs> or whatever it was. We set priorities for ourselves depending on where we're at. Um, my, my research on this was really quite enlightening because what I found is that everything I read almost, maybe I haven't touched everything on Google, <laughs> but everything I was reading was that, how do we set priorities for ourselves? How do we um, plan our time? How do we choose what makes us happy? How do we um, learn to work ourselves into a better job? How do we set priorities around the schooling we take or, or the positions that we want to shift into or responsibilities we wanna take? And everything was about me, me, me. <laughs> it was all about how do I set my priorities? And then as I'm doing all of this reading and I'm thinking, so if I'm out there and I've kind of set my priorities and I've found my grounding and I know what makes me happy and, and what I love to do and where my skills are and how I'm gonna formulate my day because I'm a planner, <laughs> how am I gonna make everything work? The idea of actually having our priorities gets it, it's great. It feels great because we feel like now we're, we've, we're centered and we know where we want to go. But what gets in the way of that? And you, you can add it to the chat. I know that we have all been in that position before where there's things that get in the way of us going out into the world 
actually starting our vehicle and going and interacting with others that gets in the way of, of our, whether it's happiness, our plan. <laughs> if anyone's had kids in the group, you know not everything goes as planned. <laughs> and, and this idea of we head out with our priorities, sometimes we get really locked into what is going to either make us happy or how we do things. And I would almost even say the things that we believe and we bring to the table we are so ready, and I said that kind of in the introduction today. Hello to those of you that are joining us. <laughs> um, in the introduction for, for this session was, okay, so I'm coming to this event, I'm coming to planning, and I've got my backpack of priorities, and I know how things work, and I've got, you know, some history in this, I've got training in this, and I come and I sit at the table, and I flip, you know, my backpack on the table, and I am ready to roll, right? Have you guys been there where it's just like we we truly believe that we have some or or maybe a few solutions to get us to the goal. What happens naturally in families or in communities or in an event planning team is everyone comes to the table and they flip their backpack on that table and they're like hey i've been trained and i've got this idea and i'm coming to to this uh, i was invited to be part of this committee i'm so excited to be here i play golf or whatever it is and so when, when we flip our own backpacks on the table, all of a sudden it feels a little uncomfortable and messy, right? Sometimes we move into positions where we're like, okay, well, we just need a leader. So somebody just needs to figure it out, unpack the back backpacks and pick something, right? And we pick a leader and that leader does that. Sometimes naturally people will float to the top if you know what I mean like if there's a, an uncomfortable silence somebody will move into it and start organizing things have you ever been on teams like that where it's just like okay well you know nobody's saying anything so I know that I have been raised and I'll talk about myself <laughs> I've been raised to be in charge or, or to have an opinion or to make a plan. That's how I was raised. So I can help here and you think you're helping. There are some people when they see all those backpacks, what do they see? They might not naturally move into a leadership position or they're not the one to compete for it. So what do they do? You can add it to the chat. For those of you that just joined us, you are welcome to, I'm, I'm watching the chat as well. I'd love to hear from you. But what happens if you are naturally maybe somebody that um, hangs back, you've got other skills, what happens when you're seeing all those backpacks on the table? You can be intimidated. You remain silent. Totally. Okay. So there can be an intimidation when when we see because it's not just about the event right you haven't just back you know packed your backpack with all of the specific things for that event you have added everything that makes you feel confident to sit at the table whatever all that is and so sometimes we get into this position where i'm i'm a little like that as much as i'm a leader sometimes i'll back off because i'm not going to compete I will feed in, you know, if there's something I can feed into, but sometimes I'll, I'll hold myself back and I'll observe and I'll see what's going on in the group. I'll read the dynamic, all of that. Some of you guys are really good at doing that. The, the problem with all of these different approaches to our personal priorities or someone else's priorities is we really haven't in the research, for those of you that just joined us, a lot of my reading leading up to this session was really about how um, how do we personally set priorities? And we see so much of that, where we're setting up our own timeline, we're setting up what we believe, we're setting up how we show up. And this idea of setting priorities collectively, I couldn't find really anything that spoke directly to that. We talk about collaboration and we talk about coming together, we talk about planning teams or teamwork. But this idea of me coming with my priorities, it's very important, but then looking at the priorities at the table, each one of those planning members, but then even beyond that, 
what is the priority that why are we all here what is the goal that we're all shooting for and how do we collectively make some kind of priority list and task you know whether it's a step-by-step -step or milestones however we want to um, design the work we're going to do together towards a higher goal which means a different set of priorities a wider set of priorities does that make sense I, I feel so passionate about this because I have been on a lot of teams where there are a lot of people and it might just be because they're uncomfortable. It might just be that they're, um, they haven't been on a committee for a while, or it might be that they have been on committees all of their lives. How many of you have been on committees with people like that? <laughs> I've been at this 40 years and you know X, Y, Z, and this is how it works. And so I think sometimes to take that step back to say, what is it about us that we're bringing to the table? What is it about the team members and the team and the priorities we should be setting as a team? But then also, who is this ultimately about? Ultimately, this is about our attendees, our event guests, our meeting, you know, whether it's a, your internal team or maybe it's your, your um, work group or whoever this is, a, you know, it might be a community group, whoever you are looking at speaking to through your event, they need to be top priority and we need to be setting our priorities towards that. So uh, for those of you that didn't get it, I will add into the chat box again, with every short guides to learning, I build a little follow along workbook. So you, you should have got it in your email um, just before the session as well. Um, but you can download that from Dropbox here. If you have any trouble downloading it, let me know. Um, it will also be on the recording of this on our YouTube channel where you'll be able to link through and find that uh, booklet as well. So as we get started, I will just share my screen here so you can take a, a peek at what this looks like and I am so great at sharing my screen as you can tell <laughs> all right can you see that mm -hmm. awesome so this is just uh just a quick look at at the booklet prioritizing what matters and this introduction here um is something that I think for all of us we have um you guys are doing that by showing up today but this idea of how do we set priorities that matter so i'm going to just read a couple of chunks of this before we get into the full you know i've got three great layers that we're going to go into um but when i talk to people and some of our clients even they'll say i'm ready to go but why is no one listening and this idea of really having a frustration around I'm just I'm read like where can I plug in like let me let me just get at it what I say here is knowing what matters to you isn't enough and so all of these when I'm talking about that backpack on the table um, we know probably for most of us that have been around the block a few times we know what matters to us but we need to be taking that step back. So what I say here are priorities can be anything that has your focus and consciously or unconsciously steers your ship. You can get a window into your priorities as you make decisions on what you choose to eat, how you fill your day and how you determine next steps, whether that's for this week or for the rest of your life. And this idea of priorities showing up for us um, I think it's important for us to recognize it. They might be from a happy desire or something that we chose to add to our life and we've chosen it as a priority, but there also might be desperation priorities, right? Like if you need to get a job, if you need to, whatever it is, we make priorities in our life that sometimes is just out of, we've got to just make life work. So understanding that not every priority we have is either conscious or unconscious and that there's also happy desires and this this sense of desperation so when we're looking at ourselves and how we're setting our own priorities to understand there are other people out there that are setting their priorities in line with what's important to them today 
uh, what makes them happy, but also it just might be a need in their life that they have just out of desperation made that a priority. So this idea of, I, I won't go into all of this because that was a bit of what I was just chatting about, but this idea of feeling frustrated, if we go to uh, what about us as a group? So when we're talking about navigating through our own lives, when we are trying to reach a specific goal, um, we may feel that frustration. And for those of you that, that came in a little late today, um, this idea of having kids, if some of you have kids, we may have a priority, you know, a set of priorities for what we need to get through in our day. But I tell you the truth, when, when kids, especially if they're younger kids, have their own priorities, there can be either some knocking of heads, there can be some frustration or maybe some confusion on how to move forward. And, and that can really become part of our event planning team dynamic as well. If we come so headstrong with our idea, our skills, what our priorities are for that event or for our project, we may feel like we just wish everyone else would get out of the way. <laughs> and, and I know when my girls are, are adults now and we love each other and we're best friends and all of that stuff, but I tell you, there were times where I, was, I wish I could just flick a switch and make you do what I need you to do right now because we all have to get where we're going. Give me a thumbs up if you felt it. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one because sometimes we feel like I, I just, I know where I need to go. And when I say the kicker, the kicker for us is that we need others. Obviously we need our kids. We wanna love our kids and love on our kids. But this idea of we need others to plan an event. Um, you know, the whole idea of teamwork makes the dream work. Um, there's a lot of steps before that dream is working. <laughs> and I really believe getting our priorities on the same page matters and it will help us get where we need to go. So this idea of, um, sorry, letting someone in here. So let's make it about them is where we talk about the work is our ideal attend attendees, guests, audience, or participants are looking at your business organization or group from the outside. So they're not seeing all the backpacks, right? Like all of the backpacks on the table, everyone kind of figuring out where do they fit? How does, the, you know, how do their priorities uh, fit with others? Feeling a little uncomfortable, maybe a bit frustrated. They're looking in from the outside. So what they're looking at is not that planning table. They're looking at your business organization or group and the events and the connections that you're planning. So this idea of the events that your audience, your ideal audience is gonna buy into and buy tickets for are the ones that speak to them. So they need to see that, your prior, that their priorities have been seen, heard and considered in your planning which is a completely different conversation than what's in my backpack, right? Completely different. It's important what's in my backpack. I'm not discounting that or what's on the table, but when we start to look at our ideal audience, our ideal guests or our team that we're trying to pull together for a meeting, we have to be looking through their eyes. So this idea of how conflicting priorities can lead us to the heart of collaboration, let's jump into that. So I'm not going to keep this section up, but you can certainly find that for those of you that have just uh, joined in, I will add it to the chat box again. But we're going to talk through these, what I call the three layers here of prioritizing what matters. And what we're going to look at is all about me. So that's you and you and you and everyone on the call, everyone that is on that event planning team as an individual, all about us as a team. And then the last piece of this is gonna be always about them, that it always has to be about the people that we are looking to serve and talk to and, and share with. So I will stop sharing here. Um, those of you that don't have the booklet link, I will just drop that in again to the chat box. Um, you don't need it to go through the rest of our session here today, but if you want to pull that down, you're welcome to do that. All right, any comments or any, uh, anything you'd like to add in the chat before I, I dive right into our three specific layers? We're good to go? Thumbs up, all good? Okay. I know that every one of us um, 
And, and every, that's why I love the work I do because every single client, everyone that I coach is coming from a different perspective, a different past. They're bringing different things to the table. So it is, it is really um, interesting for me to see where there are opportunities for us to intersect with others. And when I start to see people coming authentically as themselves, if you have been to any candy workshops, we talk a lot about that. How do we really start to dig into who we are, our passion, our purpose, and how do we start applying that in a bigger sense? So I talk a lot about that. This time when we're talking about prioritizing what matters, it's really important for me to have you understand that, that yes, we need to get super clear on ourselves and our purpose and how we're showing up but that there's gonna be something greater for us if we can collaborate. So the first section that I wanna talk about here, and I'm gonna put my little picture of it. Can you see my heart there? Maybe not. <laughs> you can see the heart there. Because when we come to what we do with passion, with um, usually, People that join an event planning team don't do it because they've been forced into it. They don't do it because they um, somehow have been coerced. Maybe some people, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe you've been on that committee a long time, but there is some kind of a heart and purpose behind it, why you're showing up. So this idea of looking at yourself. So let's take a look at ourselves. This, um, I, when I think of how I've made decisions in the past, and what cry, cry, sorry, criteria do I use? This is where I can start to look and for yourselves as you're working through the booklet after this session, take some time and think about how you are making decisions. How have you made decisions in the past? Maybe you have done a huge pivot in the last year where now you're making decisions that look different now um, for different reasons. The really digging into how do we, um, decide sort of how do we spend our time how do we fill our days who do we talk to all of that will help you get a picture of why you filled your backpack the way that you have and for those of you that just joined us your backpack means all your skills great ideas your passion to join in with this event and you have come to that planning table and you've thrown that backpack on the table and now you're ready to start unpacking that so that has come from your past. Your perspective is the second, a second step for this when you start to do this, this uh, work on looking back at yourself. So your perspective is how are you showing up and sharing the things that you believe to be true for yourself? So how we show up is so important because sometimes, like I said earlier, sometimes you're showing up and you are um, showing up as the leader you are showing up as the visionary, you are showing up as the planner, you are showing up as somebody that is great with money and can take care of the budget. We put ourselves naturally in roles where we are taking a perspective of either we're competent in it, we're confident in it, or a little of both, or, or we really feel like we can um, apply our skills and our background and our abilities to make this event work. So our perspective, sometimes people actually feel maybe insecure. I just had a conversation with a client yesterday that was having some, um, if you've heard of imposter syndrome. <laughs> so she was asked to show up in a certain way. She's like, I think I could do it, but I feel like I'm being a fake, you know, or I feel like I'm not sure if I can make, you know, pull this off. If you've got somebody that is looking at your event planning goals and your team and their role on the team where they're kind of like I'm not sure why I'm here <laughs> but I feel like maybe I, I'm in either in the wrong room or the wrong place or maybe I've got the wrong role but I'm willing to try to figure it out that is a very unique perspective that needs to be considered and we need to know that about ourselves it doesn't mean that you shouldn't take the role or you shouldn't be on the team it just means that we need to be more aware of how we are showing up if we are always the leader, I was talking about that a little bit earlier, if we always throw ourselves into the leadership position and start taking over when there, there's an uncomfortable silence, um, maybe we need to be looking at ourselves and how we're showing up, where how do we start to take the step back? We might believe to be true for ourselves that we fix things, 
but maybe in this context, we need to be looking at that perspective might not be helpful right now. Maybe there'll be a place for it in time, but right now, what, how does this look? How am I showing up? And the last one is your priorities. So what gets your attention, captures your time and rises to the top of your priority list. So our priorities, that backpack full of stuff and how we set our own priorities comes to the table because it's got our attention. So when we set our intention on, attention on something or it's, it, it, it's a, a reason why we maybe joined the team, why we love our, this event. Um, what is rising to the top for you and being very aware of yourself? Like, what, why am I here? Specifically, me, <laughs> you, why are you sitting at that table? And what is it about your priorities in your life, in your work that have brought you to this table today? It's super important for us to be self-aware enough that we get it. I have had people join a board, for example, where they are on the board because they want to be seen by a certain group of people. And planning that event means that they will be seen even more, they'll have a hand in it. Sure, they wanna help, but if I know that my priority is to get advancement at work, for example, and I know to get that advancement at work, if I joined this particular board in this particular industry, that might help my chances. It doesn't mean that priority is wrong for some reason. It just means you need to be aware of it because it will color your perspective on how the team starts choosing what to do, right? Does that make sense? I just want to kind of rest on that for a second because sometimes we think um, we can either hide that sort of our priority or what's in our backpack because it's just like, well, that's for me. I'm, I'm trying to get a promotion. I try, I'm trying to whatever, make a sale over here, whatever it is. And we allow that to color our expression at the table, <laughs> how we show up, what we say, what we say yes to or no to at the table. Again, there is, thank you, uh, somebody just added in, in the uh, chat that it makes sense. So, so it is, I, and I just want um, for all of us in any commitment that we make, that we really allow ourselves to take the step back, do that introspection, understand why we're there, and also be honest with the people at the table, what's in it for you? Because they're also thinking what's in it for me, right? It's just human nature. So moving on, and I need to watch my time here, where are we at? Okay, moving on to our priorities. So the second layer to this is when we have our heart here, so we've kind of worked, uh, worked through what does it mean for us at the bottom here to really have, um, to show up authentically, to make sure that we're being honest with ourselves and with our teammates and understanding what is our perspective, what are we bringing to that table, um, as well as the skills, abilities, all the rest of that that comes with it. This second heart is really when we start looking around at the table. This is the collective heart, the beating heart of your planning team. Um, you need all sorts of perspectives. You need all sorts of people coming from all sorts of different past experiences, with all sorts of great ideas and, and skills, abilities to add to the pot, right? So the backpacks on the table are actually pretty exciting. If you look at it from a place of, I'm showing up in this way, here's my backpack of stuff. But if, if collectively we take time to look at each one in the group, which is really made up of, of a bunch of families are like this, communities are like this, workplaces are like this, they're made up of people that have their own priorities, have their own passions, have their own uh, purpose of being there and ways of showing up. But the collective is what makes this so exciting. And I think if you're involved in events, this collective of people and finding that collective beating heart is what keeps many of us coming back over and over and over again, because we just know that there's something about this. 
And I am a firm believer. I know I, I know some of you guys on, on the line today, but but where face to face was where we could tangibly feel this. We could feel, you know, the energy in the room and we could feel the passion of the speaker and all of that, right? I believe this still exists because we're still humans, right? We're still here. You guys are here for me and I'm here for you. So it's still happening, right? This idea of our past. So sometimes when looking at those um, at the planning table, how have they each made decisions in their past? And maybe this might be a really great point where we start to say, not just what brought you here to plan this event. And we go through sort of the introductions and everybody gets their two to three minutes to sort of do their little blurb on who they are and what they're gonna bring to the table. What if we actually spent a full meeting on who are you, what's your backpack? <laughs> and, and why does that backpack matter to you? Like, what if we truly spent the time and ask people all those first questions. <laughs> that was the, sort of in that first section. What if we asked them those questions so that we truly got to the heart of why are they there? And not so that we can necessarily plug them into the treasurer role or the people role because they're really good with people or the, you know what I mean? Yeah? Okay, so this idea of people being, you know, they're really, it, they're coming to this with everything they've got. And if we don't give them a chance to unpack the backpack, <laughs> we may see things kind of go off the rails sometimes because it's got to come out somewhere. If somebody is a true leader and they're feeling like they're not given the opportunity to lead in some capacity, it will come out in, I believe, in a way that might be unhealthy for the team, it might be disruptive to the team, or they just might be, you know, perceived as a bully, or something like that, right? If somebody is, you know, they're coming to this, and they're a little bit shy, they haven't had that opportunity to plan events before, or even be part of your group or your organization before, but they're coming to this, and they're, they're wanting to kind of slink back a little bit, if we haven't given them the chance to unpack their backpack <laughs> at the table, so you really get to know them and why they're there. Obviously, they're there for a reason. They've done the brave thing and they're showing up at the table. If we haven't had the chance to really understand where they're coming from, what matters to them, and how they want to show up, what's truth for them, what's, what, where does their uh, passion and belief come from, it will come out in other ways, right? We might see that person, sorry, I'm pointing at whatever. It, it, uh, <laughs> we might see that person as somebody that is insecure. We might see that person as somebody that is having conversations after the conversations. Have you ever been in teams like that where they don't wanna say something at the table because they're a little bit like, I'm not even sure if I should be here or I, I may not have that skill that Jim has or whatever it is. So then they back off but they need, it has to go somewhere. So they might have that conversation that becomes either disruptive or even toxic to the planning group. Or they may leave the group, you don't know why. Um, so volunteer teams are very much like this, not, not all of them. They might be incredibly passionate to start. They might be all in and everything's amazing and then they're gone. That person somehow is just like, you know what, I'm out. <laughs> you know, don't tell everybody or whatever, or after, at the end of this meeting, I'm going to whatever. So then they just kind of back off and they're out. And what happens is many times the people I talk to, especially, I don't want to say just volunteers, it happens on teams as well, but where they're gone and then they start talking to other people, they're like, oh yeah, I, you know, no one cared that I was even there. Or I never had a chance to speak because Nancy was always all over it, you know, <laughs> or I know that I'm really fantastic at planning this aspect, but I never got the opportunity. We forget sometimes why people leave, not that it's just our fault or the team's fault or whatever, but sometimes it comes back to how are we as a collective and we want to create that beating heart of the collective, how are we allowing these people to be part of that beating heart and how can they be if they're not really able to show up as themselves 
with their, you know, and, and obviously not everything in the, in the backpack is going to work in this context, but where have we given them a chance to share? Super, super important. Um, their perspective, so this idea of what kind of lived experience, professional skills, or, or opinions are represented at the table. So that is their perspective. And the last one in this section is um, our priorities. So as a group, what are our priorities? So the question I ask here is, where is the common ground and the unique intersection points where members can collaborate? So do you guys have any ideas or um, examples that you want to add into the chat box of where you've seen this work? Where you've seen, um, I know some of you on the call and I know some examples, but, but this idea of where do you see these people in your, on, at your planning table, in your organization, ones that want to invest, where it is actually working? What are some of those components of creating this beating heart. Does that make sense? Industry associations. Okay. Yep. Yep. So does that mean that you are associated in the same industry? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Anything else? What kind of creates this common bond, that beat that can happen? The common ground and intersecting points, common ground might mean we are all for this cause. We want to save animals that are being abused. That might be part of this beating heart, right? We might all feel like, oh, we've got a, thank you, a, a common problem we want to solve. Right, exactly. And you can be an entrepreneur running an event, and you can still bring people like-minded partners or organizations with you, um, especially through COVID. I've seen some amazing partnerships that have been created where this beating heart of the collective planning team becomes something that is so much greater than any one component or any one person or any one even business where they start to beat together and you start to see um, these partnerships happen. It's actually been really cool over the last 12 months as much as it has been, um, well, like herding cats, I guess, in some, in some ways. But when you see the, the collaborations that are working, you start to see the bigger picture. Perfect. So we've got raising funds for a charity that they are connected to, absolutely. I think this idea of raising funds um, for a charity that they're all connected to, where you you all, for some reason, in your backpack, let's say um, cancer um, awareness, you know, what families, let's say uh, families living um, with the effects of cancer in their family, where there is some kind of a common denominator that not only do they care about that charity, but they care about the work that absolutely needs to happen. And so when you start to find a lot of um, nonprofits are built this way, they might be a group of people that care about something and they're looking to um, increase awareness, they're looking to raise funds, they're looking to bring partners on, getting, uh, getting media involved. But it really, this critical mass of people, that's what happens here when movements are started. When, um, when policies are changed in government, it happens here. We can only do so much as an individual, but it happens here. And when I talk about events, I always talk about any kind of connecting point you have with your customers or your donors or your group or your community, that's where the event sits. And so this idea of the event feeling the heart of the committee Boy, I can tell it when I'm when I'm on site or if I'm helping somebody, I can tell whether that heart is beating or if it's skipping beats. <laughs> and, and, and they're just not not that they're not alive and they're not functioning, but but they're they're not cohesive. They haven't found that common ground and the intersecting points where they are going to be able to truly look like one body moving forward. Awesome. So we've got another, just one more comment here. Um, our group has a common goal of helping professionals in transition. 
Perfect. So when we set our vision, mission, goals, all of that good stuff that happens in our organizations to allow that to become part of this beating heart, part of the connecting point, which is also, that's a whole other workshop, but <laughs> which is also why I talk about the pearl of that purpose and how does that keep showing up? How do you make that such, that pearl should be the priority of what your purpose is so people can attach themselves to it and understand that they can actually um, create a larger, you know, more healthy <laughs> beating heart here. Perfect. Okay, awesome. So just in light of time, I do want to get to our last one where we talk, uh, last but not least, about our ideal customer, our ideal participants, our ideal attendees. They might be people on your team that you are really trying to nurture and grow a team. This idea of um, looking at these ideal groups that we want to bring into an event or into some kind of connecting point with us. What has brought them to prioritize events in the past? So again, we want to look at the past. We want to look at where have they been? Because when we look at this heart down here, um, your participants, attendees, also have their own priorities. <laughs> they also have packed a backpack, right? Like, it's just how we are all built. They have set priorities. They have had priorities thrown on them. They have priorities at work. Every one of your attendees obviously is human. So they are going to show up with a set of priorities. It doesn't mean that your event has to meet every one of their priorities in their life, right? Like that's not our job to do that. What it does mean is we need to get very familiar with them and what makes them tick literally actually they're heart sick. <laughs> we need to be in that position where we're allowing ourselves to ask them the questions. Again, that is sort of another, another workshop, another conversation about who is your ideal attendee. That's different, a little bit. But what we're talking about here is once you really find a niche, you find a group you wanna to talk to, you know where you're going with your event or your connection, what is it that really has driven them in the past to say yes to an event? I think sometimes we feel um, we're so busy looking at ourselves and saying everyone should love us, right? Us, you know, the, the company, the organization, the cause. Everyone should care that animals are getting abused. Yes? Yes, I see you nodding. <laughs> but is that my top priority? Maybe not, right? For each one of you on the call and everybody watching this after, you are going to come to saying yes to an event because of something that has driven you, that's in your backpack that you cannot let go of, that you know you need to buy a ticket. You need to go learn that thing. You need to, whatever it is, right? You have motivators that are going to push you towards something that you need. Like if you have been out of a job this last year, you will be motivated to go to a course to learn what you need to, to become uh, viable in the industry you want to work in, whatever it is. So we all come as attendees. We all come to buying that ticket for a reason. And so this idea of looking into their past, what makes them tick, being willing to go there and find out what is that purpose for them will then lead us to the next step of this where it's their perspective. So what is the perspective of your attendees? This idea of where are they showing up this is actually really fun for me when I start to look at um, a certain group or a certain um, organization that's running some kind of an event. And I start to look at where are your people? <laughs> when I talk about herding cats, they're probably all over the place, right? They've got lots of different, you know, their, their heart is beating for a lot of different things, but there might be some kind of an intersecting point with you and with them and where this, your team and that, you know, the beating heart, of your planning team is going to make sense and resonate with them where they're like, I just, there's something about that group or there's some, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about this idea of the common goal of helping prof professionals in transition. Thank you for that. Um, so this idea of if, if there is a common goal here of helping professionals, where are those professionals? Are they in transition to what? <laughs> like really 
getting deeper into what is their perspective? What are they feeling? What are they thinking? And this idea that they need to be seen and heard and considered as you're planning your event changes the, the dynamic where all of those backpacks and everything inside of them that we bring to a planning team may or may not something, well, inside of that, there's gonna be some things that will apply in our planning, but it will be really important that we're pulling out the right tools, the right perspectives, right meaning, the things that will resonate with our ideal audience. And so, so important for us to make sure that we don't get lost in this either, that we don't get lost in this beating heart. And, and, and I've seen this happen too, where it becomes a club. You know, your event planning team just becomes people that it's like, us for and no more because we're just having a lot of fun over here <laughs> planning <laughs> we're having a lot of fun getting together and you know like and then we forget that there's another layer to this and i know that many many of you have probably been on those teams and and honestly some of those teams are the teams that you have left or you're not sure that that's not the right color <laughs> that you have left um, your attendees in the dust because you're so busy and happy over here with your healthy beating heart and everyone feels great and that's its own thing. But if your goal is to, to really connect well with the people that you are trying to reach, with the ones that you want at your event, with the people that you want to um, re-engage with in 10, you know, 20, 30 different ways over the course of a year, if you aren't bringing them into the, the love here, <laughs> they'll stay for a little while. They might attend that event because they, they felt something that was there, but if there's nothing in it for them or a little bit in it for them, they will not re-engage. They're probably not gonna come back. And really, like somebody said, raise money for charity through your event. They probably will not, if, even if they have, they probably not give money again. They probably will just throw your um, direct mail in the recycling bin. <laughs> They'll probably just, you know, tune you out or unfollow you on social media. Does anyone get sort of the, the importance or do you understand the importance of that? Where we can't, we can't just feel the love here and let it stop there. It also, I believe, stops the flow. It stops this relationship building. It stops the new in innovation that can happen here if we let it get stagnant. So the last piece of this, their priorities, um, which I just kind of chatted about, but does your event fit with where they're at, what they believe and match their priorities? So if you were to take this booklet, I've kind of spread it out into a bunch of pages, but if you were to print off that booklet that you got today and work through that for yourself with your team and then looking outside to who you want at your events, and I'll say events because we talk connection cycles are like 12 to 18 months. And so if you really get serious about looking at setting priorities that matter, it's, it's one of those things that will set you on the right track, no matter how large or small your event will be, um, and how many of those events you plan. And now in our world of, I actually just started, I teach at MRU, I teach um, event management. There are a few courses and the, the one I just started two days ago is um, marketing your events. And some of the conversations we've been having um, tie into when I, when I started planning events years and years and years ago, there was no internet, there were no phones, there were no social media handles. <laughs> it was just not a thing back then. And I remember like 10 years ago, I was on a radio interview when I first, well, I guess I was 12 years ago when I first started my company and I was talking about this new thing, blogs, you know, you might want to add blogs to your event promotion <laughs> and, and listening to it now. I'm like, oh, that's, it just feels like things are changing and they're, they're changing so much faster now too. That this idea of really um, setting priorities for our events and making sure that we're showing up over and over again and integrating our event planning with our event promotions, with our relationship building, all of that matters. And when we start to think about sort of this bigger picture of where we want to take our event attendees in time, it, it will be the life of our business 
it will be the, the life of our organization. We will make the money, create the relationships that will allow us to be sustainable for this heartbeat to be sustainable. So incredibly important. And I'm sorry if I, I didn't leave a lot of time for questions. I'm so passionate about this one, but I just feel like there is this opportunity for us all if we really take this, um, not just seriously for ourselves and commit ourselves to an event team, but really taking it seriously, um, the people at the table and the ones that we truly are wanting to serve. So I, I, I get that we are right at time, um, but I, I just wanna leave you with that, knowing that you guys have what you need to do what you need to do. Um, many of you are on committees or, or working for businesses and already planning events and um, more power to you because this is this is a really tough time right now to be planning any kind of an event. Um, but I do want to um, I do want to share with you that there are more uh, guides. So the Candy Short Guides to Learning, we've done like seven or eight of them now, um, but you can find all of those links to all of our past topics at candyconsulting.ca slash guides. And there's a booklet with each. Um, you just have to click on the website uh, link and it'll take you to the YouTube. So any questions on this, I do have that in the booklet as well. Feel free to email me or let me know if there's anything else that, uh, that I can support you in this. Or even better, if you work through that booklet and you want to have a follow-up call where we actually can talk through each one of those layers, I would love to do that for you because I think it might help you set your sails in the right direction for this next year. It's, it's a tough one, but I think we can make it if we do this together. So thank you so much everybody for, for being here. Any last questions, comments, we're good to go. Keep planning, it matters. Love you all. <laughs> we'll see you again.